Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 Listen to the conversation between a doctor's secretary and Mr. Jones, who wants to make an appointment with the doctor. Now look at questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Dr. Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. Okay. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones. Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. By the way, my name's Rebecca. I'm Dr. Ritter's secretary. Have you seen Dr. Ritter before, Mr. Jones? Actually, no, Rebecca. We've only just moved to Los Angeles two days ago. Great. Welcome to LA, Mr. Jones. Thank you. When would you like to come in? Any time this week would be fine. I don't have to go into office until next Monday. OK, let me see. But first, to see how long you'll need, could you tell me why you need the medical? My insurance company needs it. And my companies are in real estate. Medical insurance also wants me to have one. Kind of killing two birds with one stone. Sure is. Insurance companies want a fairly complete examination, so that means you'll have to come in the morning and don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before. No problem. Let me see. Would 9am Thursday be convenient? 9am Thursday. No problem. Oh, I forgot. We have a meeting with my children's new headmaster that morning. That's at 11. Look at questions 6 to 10. What school is that? Beverly Hills High School. Oh, that's no problem. The whole examination will take about an hour, maybe a bit more, and the school is only two blocks from here, a three-minute walk, so you'll have plenty of time. That's good. So 9am Thursday. You got it. Now, to save time when you get here, I'll ask you a few questions. Fire away. First, what is your personal medical insurance company, Mr. Jones? Blue Cross. Blue Cross. And how old are you? 46 today. Happy birthday! Having a big party? Not really. We don't know anybody here yet, except for two neighbours. I think my family planned to take me out to dinner. A secret surprise, hey? OK, back to Blue Cross. I'm just checking what they need. Let's see. Blood pressure, standard blood and urine tests, cholesterol levels, ECG, checking for diabetes, heart disease, the usual things. Do you have a medical condition at the moment, Mr. Jones? None at all. Touch wood. Fit as a fiddle. That's great. I'm sure you'll stay that way. And do you know the name of your company's health plan? Yes, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is. The Kaiser Health Insurance Company. Kaiser, yes. They need the same information as Blue Cross. So, as you said, killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And can I have your telephone number, Mr. Jones? Sure. My cell phone is 13805-56721. 13805-56721. Right. And my home number is area code 805-523-0296. 805-523-0296. And do you have email? Yes. The address is pjones12 
at hotspot.com. pjones12 at hotspot.com. That's it. Well, that's all I need for now. See you Thursday, Mr. Jones. Sure thing, Rebecca. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear an introduction to a group tour to Australia by a travel company manager. First look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning everybody and welcome to Morning Sun Travel. I'm Rick Smith and I manage our group tours to Australia, New Zealand and the South Sea Islands. It's good to see so many of you here. As you know, I'm going to introduce our latest product, the 21 Day Grand Australian Tour. First of all, why did we develop this new tour? Well, our two week Aussie tours have proved really popular over the past few years. So after doing some market research, we found that there's a demand for a longer tour. In fact, looking around, I see some faces I recognise. You two went on our Australian tour last year, right? Great. Good to see you back again. If you think I'm exaggerating about Australia, you can interrupt me. Another thing. It's a long way from England to Australia, and many of our clients think it's a pity to go all that way for just a couple of weeks. So, our first three-week tour will head off in early November, about three months from now. Now, if we dim the light a bit, I'll show you some slides of what we'll do and see down under. Our first stop will be Sydney. It's one of my favourite cities, and we'll arrive mid-morning and check into one of my favourite hotels, the Five Seasons Hotel, Sydney. America's most popular travel magazine selected it as the best hotel in Australia. Believe me, it deserves every one of its five stars. It has fantastic views of Sydney Harbour, the famous Opera House and Sydney Harbour Bridge. And for those of you who were born to shop, it's just a short walk away from Sydney's major shopping and business districts. Great restaurants and bars. And for those of us who like to keep fit, there's a state-of-the-art spa and fitness centre with sauna and heated outdoor pool. We'll have lunch in the hotel, and then off we'll go to explore. No time for a rest. To get over jet lag, it's best to get out and do something energetic. Our first afternoon, we'll stroll around the harbour and visit the Sydney Opera House. Then we'll have a relaxed evening dining at Luigi's Place, one of the city's best Italian restaurants. Day two. Lots of fresh air. We'll have a day trip to the Blue Mountains. Just look at these slides. Wonderful views complete with a walk through temperate rainforests. And these pictures are Featherdale Wildlife Park, the best wildlife park in Sydney, where you can feed kangaroos, have your photo taken with koala bears, and see over 2,000 different other types of Australian animals, including crocodiles, Tasmanian devils, wombats. Look at this picture of a wombat. Looks like a bear with short legs. And penguins, dingoes, and snakes. Lots of snakes. Some of Australia's snakes are the most poisonous in the world. And you can also learn about Aboriginal culture. And this is fun. Try throwing a boomerang. Look at questions 16 to 20.
And look at these slides. Australia's Grand Canyon, the Megalong and Jamison Valleys. Incredible. On the way back, we'll get in our bus and stop at the Sydney 2000 Olympic site, where you can see Stadium Australia, the Superdome, the Aquatic Centre, the Olympic Village, and lots more. So, day two, great day. But that's not all. After that, we'll take a cruise down the Parramatta River, under the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and into Sydney Harbour. Any questions so far? OK, let's see what we'll be doing on day three. Anyone flown in a seaplane? Uh, just a few of you. Well, a visit to Sydney would not be complete without viewing the world-famous Bondi Beach from 500 feet in the air. And this is a picture of Bondi Beach. We take off from Rose Bay, which is not far from our hotel. This should be a slide of Rose Bay. Yes, it is. You can see the seaplane taking off. Then we fly down the coast to Bondi Beach. Look at that surf. Returning back up the coast, we fly over Manly and Long Reef before returning to the harbour. Climbing to a height of 1,000 feet for a vista of Sydney Harbour, which will take your breath away. Look at this slide. And this one. Wow! And then back to Rose Bay. Then it'll be time for lunch in Chinatown. That's a great thing about Australia. It's a country of immigrants, so in the cities you can get just about any food you like. Greek, Chinese, Mexican, you name it. And perhaps you'd like to try kangaroo meat, very low fat. And after a big lunch, we'll go to walk it off in Luna Park. I can't begin to tell you how much there is to see and do here. We'll just run through a few slides. Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say, to give you an idea. Hey, I see the coffee's here. It's a bit early, not to worry. Let's all grab a cup now, and then we'll move on to Melbourne, then the Great Barrier Reef, and all the other great places on the itinerary. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two business studies students, Jack and Sarah, talking to their tutor about a presentation they are preparing. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hello, you two. Have a seat. <clears throat> OK. Um, so you're going to tell me about the presentation you're preparing for next week's marketing seminar, right? That's right. We've drafted this plan for you to look at. OK, thanks. Perhaps you could just talk me through it, could you? Uh, Sarah, do you want to begin? Yes. Uh, well, we're going to compare the websites of two bicycle companies. Right, and they're called Hills, Cycles and Wheels Unlimited? Yes, and first of all, we've compared the content of each site and the presentation. Mm -hmm. Then we've done an evaluation of each one. OK, and did you find much difference between the two websites, Jack? Quite a bit, yes. Wheels Unlimited has a lot more pages for a start. Both companies show their catalogue. I mean, pictures of different models of bike with specifications. And prices? Yes, they're there too, although they list them in different ways. Hill cycles have got them next to the pictures, 
and Wills Unlimited show them on a separate page. But Wills Unlimited advertises lots of other products connected with bikes, like helmets and clothing and tools. Yes, all kinds of things. And hill cycles? No, they only show the bikes themselves. Okay. Well, is there anything on the Hill Cycles website that Wheels Unlimited doesn't have? Not really. Yes, there is. It's got a little photo of the original shop and a paragraph about the history of the company. It's family owned. Oh yes, I forgot about that. Right.、Uh, that's the content then.、Mm. And you compared the functions of the two websites, did you? Yes. Hill Cycles doesn't have any facility for online ordering. You have to ring up to order something. That's the only way you can do it. Well, no. You can send off for a paper catalogue with an order form. Oh yes, I suppose so. But with Wills Unlimited, you can order online or in the conventional ways. That's right. Fine. Okay. And what about the presentation? Did you find any particular differences there or similarities? What about visuals? As I said, both the sites have got pictures, and they're both quite attractive. But Wills Unlimited hasn't got any moving graphics. Yes, Hill Cycles has got an animated cartoon at the top of the homepage. Right. Well, it looks as if you've got plenty to talk about. There are other things too, but those are the main things we noticed. Okay. Well, you'd better stick to the most obvious differences because you've only got ten minutes for the whole presentation, haven't you?、Mm. And you said you're going to evaluate each site as well, didn't you? How are you going to do that? I mean, what criteria will you use? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. We thought we'd use three criteria: how attractive each website is, how user-friendly it is, and how closely it targets its potential customers. Do you think that's okay? Sounds fine, but I'd look at the criteria in a different order if I were you, because really you've got to look at attractiveness and user-friendliness in relation to the people the website is aiming at. So I'd deal with that criterion first if I were you. Right. What about the timing? Have you thought of that? Ten minutes is very short, you know. Yes, we tried it out <laughs> several times, and we've decided to spend four minutes comparing the two sites, then three minutes evaluating them, and leave three minutes for questions. That's not really enough, but well, it sounds about right to me. You've got ten minutes altogether, and you've got to stick to that limit. It's good practice. And at least the audience won't have time to get bored. <laughs> <laughs>、um, what visuals are you going to use? We're going to use PowerPoint and a flip chart as well. So we can show two things at once. For example, we're going to start by showing the home pages of each website, and we're going to put up a list of key features on the flip chart at the same time. Okay, and it's a joint presentation. So have you decided how you're going to share the work? Yes. First, we thought we'd keep taking it in turns to speak. Sarah would say a bit, then I'd take over, and so on. Then we thought we'd just divide it into two equal parts and do one part each, but it was all too complicated. So Sarah's going to do all the talking, and I'm going to manage the visuals, and hope we can coordinate properly. It's the only way we can fit everything in. Well, good. You've obviously worked hard, and you've been very careful with the details. Only one thing I would say: make sure that you keep your visuals simple. I mean, if you're showing a list of key features, for example, you should make it as brief as possible. Just use bullet points and simple phrases, even single words. Your audience won't have much reading time. It's a classic mistake with seminar presentations to present so much information that the audience can't process it quickly enough, and they stop listening to what you're saying. Okay? Yes.、Mm. Right. Okay. And now let's talk about.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the way in which elephants communicate. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'm going to continue the theme of animal communication, and I'm going to describe some of the latest research into the largest of all land animals, and that is the elephant, of course. Let me begin by briefly outlining the structure of elephant society. Elephants live in layered societies. The basic family unit is formed of small groups of adult females who are related to each other, and their young of both sexes. Now the females remain in their families for life, they're highly social, but male elephants leave their families at about 14 years of age. They travel alone or congregate in small, loose groups with other males, occasionally joining a family on a temporary basis. When males are ready to mate, they wander widely, searching for receptive females. The family unit, on the other hand, often contains three generations, and it can remain stable for decades or even centuries. Then, each family associates with between one and five other families, probably consisting of their more distant relatives. Scientists call these groups of families bond groups, and bond groups belong in turn to even larger groups called clans. So elephants have a complex social structure, and like other social animals, they have to be able to communicate. But what baffled early naturalists was their ability to communicate over long distances. So they set about researching this question. In one experiment, scientists fitted groups of elephants with radio tracking collars. And what they observed about their behavior really intrigued them. Because they found that there was some sort of coordination between families. For example, two separate family groups might move in parallel to each other, miles apart, and then change directions simultaneously, either turning or moving towards each other. Now, elephants have a keen sense of smell, which they use whenever they can. But smell alone couldn't account for these synchronized movements, because the wind often carries odors in the wrong direction. So the scientists concluded that the elephants were using their hearing instead, and attention then turned to the nature of elephant calls. In another experiment, scientists from Cornell University in America went to Etosha National Park in Namibia, and they produced a recording of calls made by a female elephant to potential mates. Then they broadcast it. And they did this from a van which was parked more than half a mile from a waterhole where several bull elephants were drinking. And two of these looked up, spread their ears wide, and then crunched through the bush towards the loudspeakers. As you can imagine, the scientists may have been alarmed at this point, but the elephants marched straight on past them in their van in search of a female elephant. But the striking aspect of this experiment was that when they replayed their recording, neither the two scientists nor the rest of their team, who were filming from a nearby tower, could hear it. And that's because the sounds that they had replayed were below the lower threshold of human hearing. In scientific terminology, the sounds are infrasonic. Elephants can make these extremely low-pitched sounds because although they have a larynx or voice box that is similar to those of all other mammals, it's much larger. But what do the sounds mean? 
Scientists from Pittsburgh Zoo in the USA have classified certain infrasonic calls based on when these occur and how other elephants react to them. They found, for example, that when individual family members reunite after separation, they greet each other very enthusiastically, and the excitement increases with the length of time that they've been separated. They trumpet and scream and touch each other. They also use a greeting rumble. This starts at a low 18 hertz, hertz is a measurement of sound pitch, crests at 25 hertz, which is a level just high enough to be audible to humans, and then falls back to 18 hertz again. In another example, an elephant attempting to locate its family uses the contact call. This call has a relatively quiet, low tone with a strong overtone which is clearly audible to humans. Immediately after contact calling, the elephant will lift and spread its ears and rotate its head as if listening for the response. The contact answer is louder and more abrupt than the greeting call, and it trails off at the end. Contact calls and answers can last for hours until the elephant successfully rejoins her family. A third type of call seems to represent a summons to move on. At the end of a meal, one member of a family moves to the edge of the group, typically lifts one leg, and flaps her ears. At the same time, she emits a let's go rumble, which arouses the family, and they start to move on. Finally, mating activity is associated with yet another group of calls. So, our understanding of elephant communication has increased considerably in recent years. However, even with the use of radio tracking collars, it's technically difficult to document the functions of long-range communication. So although scientists are aware that elephants may know the whereabouts and possibly the activities of other elephants that are several miles away, there may be a lot of subtle long-range interactions which are still not evident. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.